All around the world, significant parts of our cultural heritage are threatened by pollution, neglect, carelessness, and greed. In learning the importance of our history, we come to understand the need to protect significant remains from the past so that future generations can come to understand their heritage. Touchdown confirmed. We are safe on Mars. The control room at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory late in the evening of August 5, Pacific Time, when word arrived that the Curiosity rover had landed safely on Mars. The one-ton rover, which dwarfs all Mars landers that came before it, will now spend a planned two years exploring the Martian surface. The mission is expected to cost $2.5 billion. Curiosity's task is to investigate the inside of Gale Crater, where a giant mound of sedimentary deposits may provide evidence of a wetter, possibly habitable Mars billions of years ago. But first it had to survive an elaborate landing sequence which appears to have gone smoothly. Curiosity landed on time and on target and soon beamed back grainy photos of its wheels and its shadow. Given the car-like size of the rover and the challenges of landing on Mars, Curiosity's landing goes down as one of the greatest parking jobs in history. Millions of people in North Korea are short of food, perpetually hungry children and pregnant and nursing mothers are suffering the most. The World Food Programme reports, South Korea's landmark donation, the biggest in more than a decade, will help ease the nutritional crisis faced by two million of this particularly vulnerable group of people. Under an agreement worked out by WFP between both countries, South Korea will donate 50,000 metric tons of rice and $4.5 million in cash for food needs in North Korea. Now, as you know already, there will be a midterm exam next week. The exam will be an open book, open note, an open internet resource exam. But you can't use a classmate or me during the exam. Many of the questions on this exam don't have definitive answers. I wish to assess your critical thinking ability and your ability to combine ideas. A poorly organized answer will not get the same grades as a well-organized answer. Here are some good ways to study for the exam. First of all, it would be better for you to organize and review your lecture notes. That means you many need to compile notes and lab test results if you have not done that already. I strongly suggest that you write trial outlines before the exam. I think it will make you feel more comfortable. Just stop by my office. It's been a challenging decade for the music industry, with a significant decrease in sales. For years, little action was taken against illegal downloads, with few effects for downloaders. However, two new approaches are seeing positive results. Firstly, the industry's working with internet service providers to slow an illegal downloader's connection. 
Secondly, it's working directly with digital music websites. In Sweden, three out of five illegal file sharers have cut back or stopped, with half of these people moving to legal websites supported by advertisements. People rarely translate another person's unique way of saying things with any degree of accuracy. This is because when we learn the meaning of words, we pick up their broad meaning but we've added subtle shades of difference which we get from our personal experiences. If you grew up in an aggressive household, the phrase, I'm angry with you, had different associations than for a person from a family where people talked through problems. We're left having to work out meaning from our own experience. So despite the fact that, say, Bob and Gina are both speaking English, Bob is really speaking, Bob English, and Gina is turning that into, Gina English, and the translation is never going to be perfect. We'll look now at a very interesting study. It was carried out by a researcher who works in two countries, Scotland and Italy, and it involved children from both of these countries aged around nine or so. Half of the children from each country spoke only their national language. However, the other half spoke their national language plus another language. During the study all the participants were given tests and quizzes which looked at a range of skills, including vocabulary understanding, problem solving, creative thinking and arithmetic. The children used their national language to complete the tasks, which involved things like copying patterns of colored blocks, orally repeating a series of numbers and giving clear definitions of words. The results were quite clear. The bilingual children were significantly more successful in the tasks. A really good illustrative example of the point I want to make is the book Journey Cake Ho, by Ruth Sawyer, based on a traditional folk tale. Teachers often read this aloud to their classes, showing the pictures to the children as they do so. They are, of course, using the words of Ruth Sawyer, and presenting the story just as the artist has visualized it. But other teachers do it differently. Instead of reading, they tell the story from memory. This gives the children a much richer experience, they can freely use their own imaginations, visualizing the story, the characters and the scenes in their mind's eye in any way they like. And, this is much closer to the way in which folk tales were passed from generation to generation, orally, without any words or pictures to restrict the imagination. When the time comes, its peers should follow suit. Of these, the European Central Bank faces the trickiest challenge, because it has acted as, in effect, the backstop to Eurozone bond markets, a mechanism that otherwise the currency bloc still lacks. But the main safety valve lies elsewhere, with banks and investors. Bitter experience has shown that debt-funded assets can magnify losses, causing financial crises. 
For this reason banks must be able to withstand any reversal of today's high asset prices and low defaults. That means raising bank capital in places where it is too low, especially the Eurozone, and not backsliding on strenuous, stress tests, as America's Treasury proposes. In the end, however, there may be no escape for investors from the low future returns and even losses that high asset prices imply. They and regulators should take a leaf out of the intelligent investor and make sure that they have a margin of safety. Here are a couple different stories you can tell about our economy. One goes like this. Eight years after the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, our economy has created jobs for 71 straight months. That's a new record. Unemployment has fallen below 5%. Last year, the typical household saw its income grow by about $2,800, the biggest one-year increase ever. And the uninsured rate is at an all-time low. All that is true. What's also true is that too much of our wealth is still taken by the top and that leaves too many families still working paycheck to paycheck, without a lot of breathing room. There are two things we can do about this. We can prey on people's worries for political gain. Or we can actually do something to help working families feel more secure in today's economy. Count me in the latter camp. And here's one thing that will help right away making sure more of our families have access to paid leave. Today, having both parents in the workforce is an economic necessity for many families. But right now, millions of Americans don't have access to even a single day of paid sick leave. Hi everybody. This weekend, we'll dedicate the newest American icon on our National Mall, the National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's a beautiful building, five stories high and some 70 feet below the ground, situated just across the street from the Washington Monument. And this museum tells a story of America that hasn't always taken a front seat in our national narrative. As a people, we've rightfully passed on the tales of the giants who built this country. But too often, willful or not, we've chosen to gloss over or ignore entirely the experience of millions upon millions of others. But this museum chooses to tell a fuller story. It doesn't gauze up some bygone era or avoid uncomfortable truths. Rather, it embraces the patriotic recognition that America is a constant work in progress that each successive generation can look upon our imperfections and decide that it is within our collective power to align this nation with the high ideals of our founding. Hi everybody, it's Joe Biden. I delivered a report to President Obama laying out how far we've come since he put me in charge of the cancer moonshot that was back in January and lay out a real vision for where we need to go in the immediate future to, to do in five years what would otherwise take ten, to inject a real sense of urgency into the fight against cancer, and to change the culture and reimagine our system in order to be able to win. When President Nixon declared war on cancer in 1971, he had no army, he had no resources, and no clear strategy. But after 45 years of progress, funding research, training scientists and physicians, and treating millions of patients, we now have the army. We now have tools, powerful tools. 
And with this moonshot, we now have a clear strategy for the road ahead. It matters, folks, because there's a consensus now that we're at an inflection point with science, medicine, and technology all advancing faster than ever and offering real promise. We can't play by the rules of 1971, we didn't have this working for us. Abandoned pueblos are scattered throughout the southwestern U.S., and at many, archaeologists have uncovered a curious artifact, the skeletons of scarlet macaws. The bird's bright red feathers are known to have been an important status symbol, a signifier of prestige for people throughout the American tropics and the southwest, both in the ancient world and today. But macaws are a tropical bird, whose range never extended north of today's U.S.-Mexico border. So how did the Pueblo people obtain the birds? To examine the bird's origin, scientists sequenced mitochondrial DNA found within macaw bones from two sites in New Mexico, Chaco Canyon and the Mimbres region. Turns out, nearly three-quarters of the birds had identical mitochondrial genome sequences, meaning the ancient birds came from the same maternal line. That suggests they were all the products of a breeding operation, perhaps in modern-day northern Mexico, rather than a random collection of wild-caught birds. Crows, she says, are what's known as partial migrants. Every year, some members of the population migrate between breeding grounds and their overwintering grounds, like parking lots. But others just stay put. So Townsend and her colleagues wanted to know if that urge to migrate was something individual crows can turn on and off. To find out, they captured 18 crows from overwintering spots in California and New York. They fitted the birds with little backpack satellite tags, and tracked them for several years. Overall, three-quarters of the birds migrated, an average of 300 miles. And more importantly, if they migrated once, they did it every year, suggesting traveling is not a habit they switch on and off. The researchers also found that migrating crows returned faithfully to the same breeding grounds every year, but were more flexible on where to overwinter which could be a good thing. To figure out these counterintuitive findings, the researchers conducted an experiment in a hotel room. They rounded up some lizards, gave them a perch, and used a leaf blower to mimic the effects of high winds. They set up a net to catch any lizards that lost their grip. As the artificial wind blew, the lizards moved so the perch took most of the airflow. But their hind legs would stick out, and if those rear limbs stuck out too far, they acted as sails. Eventually those back legs were blown off the perch, and the lizards were just holding on with their front two legs. And they could only hold on like that for so long as the wind speed increased further and further, until eventually they were blown off the perch and into the nets so shorter back legs gave a survival advantage. A trait that might be passed on to the next lizard generation.